Building the Future, Green Building in the New Millennium, brought to you by Sustainable Homes of the Future. Yeah. Our natural world is in crisis. Buildings emit 40% of carbon globally. We need solutions now. Join the conversation today. Welcome, everybody, to Building the Future, Green Building in the New Millennium. Uh, I'm Ian Sollenberger, your host, and today, uh, very excited to have with me Sean Armstrong, who is Managing Principal of Redwood Energy, um, also co-founder of the company. Um, welcome, Sean. Thanks for being here. Absolutely, Ian. Thanks for having me. Definitely. Um, we've been exploring, you know, on our podcast, sort of how-tos, you know, benefits, uh, cost-benefit analysis of different systems and all kinds of stuff like that. What I like to do on these interviews is get to know, you know, the, the people because there aren't, you know, there aren't a ton of them actually. You know, it's, it's a pretty small space. You start going to these green build conferences and things and you see the same faces over and over again. And Sean is somebody who's always at uh, the green build and the net zero conferences and um, been talking a lot about that on the podcast. So, you know, I guess my biggest question is, what do you guys do at Redwood Energy? And uh, just to kind of kick us off and where are you located? Uh, where do you live? You know, we're gonna talk about houses and buildings and stuff. So like, what inspires you sort of your day to day? Um, gotcha. Existence? Okay, well, first off, um, you know, what is that quote that I've had on a whole bunch of activist t-shirts over my life since I was 14? It's never doubt that a small group of committed individuals can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has by Margaret Mead. Amazing. And uh, so, you know, when you go to all these green building conferences and you realize that the movement is shaped in part by a cohort of similarly minded people of different ages, but who keep on showing up and commit a lot of extra energy um, to make a change. Like that's, it doesn't take a ton of people. It, it takes a successful effort, but yeah. Um, so I was raised by activists, just to put it out there. My mom uh, wouldn't give birth to me on January 9th. She held me in uh, the last couple of minutes so that I wouldn't be born on Nixon's birthday in 1976. <laughs> We'd just gotten pardoned and she was furious after he had sent her first husband to war you know done so much to her generation so um, i'm born on 1202 a.m on january 10th and i was raised like on a, uh, an environmentally oriented back to the lander farm as a kid in rural wisconsin and my parents were kind of successful artists slash they owned the jewelry's workshop it was a jewelry store that made handmade jewelry and it was oh, successful cool. as like hippie jewelry with hippie jewelers with maybe 20 people in the back um, so my own little path is I thought I was going to be a science teacher. I was so impressed by my teachers when I was growing up, loved them, you know, consider them some of my closest friends as a nerd. I was a super nerd, <laughs> uh, terrible. I had like a big overbite and drooled and no one would date me. And I was, I embarrassed myself on the daily. Um, so <laughs> my teachers were paid to hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And so you had some some built-in friendships. Uh, that's great. Someone's got to hang out with nerds. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I thought I was going to be a biology teacher. I got my credentials. I did that for a few years, and I wasn't so very successful at getting along with principals. I had terrific students. It was a fantastic <laughs> experience with students, but um, you know, one of the schools, I, I got in trouble for supporting the students when they were protesting the um, militarism of the first 9-11 celebration at the high school when the military all came in. And they wore like black armbands, which Supreme Court had ruled was legal mm -hmm. back in the Vietnam era. So the principal tried to fire me like right off the bat for being like, hey kids, no, this is legal. What you're doing, you shouldn't be getting suspended. Like, this is <laughs> only legit. This got hassled decades. This got resolved decades ago. Um, so after a few experiences, like that, yeah. um, I decided to go hang out with some very coarse and powerful people at a development company called the Danco Group. What, uh, and, uh, what led you to, I mean, other than the, the you know, utter failure of your relationship with principals uh, <laughs> and teaching, what, you know, what sort of 
what, what was the spark that had you go in that direction? Was it just sort of an organic thing? Oh, uh, well, it was one of the paths I'd been on. Um, I had taken construction science classes in college okay. and I had uh, lived in, volunteered at, and then lived in a demonstration house on campus oh, that nice. was specific to, was appropriate technology, a 70s idea where you intellectually consider the social and economic impacts of technologies, not just are they convenient, but hmm. what do they do to the environment and to the people? True sustainability from, from the beginning. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah, like it was, so no, the concept of sustainability is like an evolution of a few other ideas that people had you know, words for before them, mm -hmm. like ecological thinking or appropriate technology. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, cool. that demonstration house, which is the last home that exists from the 70s, Carter started nationwide hundreds of demonstration homes and Reagan canceled the funding for that when he got into office. This was the only one that was student funded and it never disappeared. So wow. it's the last demonstration house from the seventies. And there are a whole bunch of- Still in existence people. today? Yeah. Incredible. So like all the communes uh, that was shut down at one time or another, and they might've restarted with different names on them, you know, with some periods of time, like the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, okay. um, sort of in the North Bay area is a famous one from the seventies, but it's, it's in a, its third incarnation and it's not, it's not the same place. Um, CCAT is the same place. Yeah. Um, There's it, just 21 to 25 year old students, three of them a year living in there and doing composting toilets and battery off grid solar with wind turbines and biodiesel and of course solar panels and tons of pedal power. Like, um, okay. When the battle for Seattle happened against the World Trade Organization in 1999, the Earth Firsters came back into the living room and we pedal powered the VCR and TV so that we could watch <laughs> the early footage of the documentaries coming out from the, wow. the tear gas filled streams, the uh, streets. Um, and when I was in college, it was, uh, it was the era in which there was physical lockdowns of roads and politicians offices with like armbands, which I never did. I got trained in, but it terrified me. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> not that brave, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> I and mean, you get tortured, you know, they do terrible things to you when you're yeah. locked up. The, that was the, the origin of the origin of using pepper spray in activist eyes. It was around here where they did it. And they, you know, these people ended up kissing themselves. They were forced them to unlock themselves or yeah. yeah and they pepper spray right in their eyes Oof. to torture them to unlock. Man. In an elected official's office, no less. Wow. I mean, this is, this is official government sanctioned torture kind of stuff. That's incredible. Um, yeah. Ugh, oh. Man. So, Anyway, yeah, um, yeah. I don't, when I was in college, I was really involved in building science, so it seemed like I could succeed yeah. hanging out with um, with that crew. And you know, developers. I mean, my wife, she swore to herself when she was fourteen years old that, that she'd never marry a developer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I went and got this job, and we're already together a few years at that point. Um, I had to make it explicitly clear that I was going there to save the world. Like that's why I was, that's why I was going to hang out. Got to work within the system to change the system, man. It's true. Yeah. Um, and so being a radical, like being, you know, I'd wear skirts to work and <laughs> I was out about my bisexuality, which was pretty provocative wow. yeah. in the early two thousands when gay marriage wasn't legal. And, you know, it was only last week that, you know, firing someone because they're bisexual was made illegal by the Supreme Court. You know, that's mm -hmm. last week's news. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So um, it did go there to try to help out with social change. And it did go there to like start this practice of building without fossil fuels. Hmm. And it was exciting. I immediately got a whole bunch of apartment complexes to work on for in the first year. And I was able to figure out technical solutions like putting in heat pumps instead of gas water heaters. Um, putting in heat pumps instead of gas space heating or having decent electric resistant stoves. How do we do that? Because it reduced costs. So my bosses were totally pleased. Wow. And, um, and I increased profitability. I was able to help them win grants because of zero net energy commitments that they didn't know how to do without mm -hmm. getting rid of the gas and adding solar in. And I'd, I'd interned for a year um, installing solar. So I was able to help them get the right priced bids so they didn't get gouged for their first efforts right help them manage costs 
Well, you were also focused on energy efficiency too in, oh, yeah. in your design. So you're not then getting housed on costs for solar just from somebody saying, yeah. oh, you need this many. You're like, no, actually, I know exactly how many I need because I did the math and I've created the most efficient design that I could possibly come up with. So Yeah, it was integrated. Right. You know, it's, you can find efficiency reduces the cost of the solar array. And in the mid 2000s, solar was, oh, five dollars a watt and right now it's 30 cents a watt wow you know it's an order of magnitude more expensive to solarize apartment complexes then mm -hmm. so efficiency was even more valuable interesting yep um so i didn't get fired there amazingly even though <laughs> i i protested the first summer in their truck on their job site where they're cutting down redwoods illegally and i went there and I had had the police escort me out they still <laughs> didn't fire me it's like i love these people as long That's as I make them money, yeah. they will let me be a complete pain, <laughs> you know? I mean... Things that the principal would have fired me for, these guys didn't. It was amazing. What's funny is, one, you know, one of my questions that I, I sent you was like, how have you found a, a niche for yourself in the building industry? But it's clear that like, you, you did it, uh, you know, for reasons that were of, of a business nature, but also like very much of a personal nature. You, you brought yourself into... Uh, the job and kind of live that out loud and and we're yeah. successful all around so you know props to that because there's not too many people you know even who don't have quite so uh, uh, maybe out there you know lives like that that can't mm -hmm. even bring some of themselves to the job so that's really cool I think, I think the world has changed more. yeah you know I, my sister got her doctorate studying transgendered activists and the <laughs> activism of simply being out and being present in and unapologetic. It's and not evangelism, it's, it's activism. Yeah. Of just presence, of just being there. I mean, it's it, being an environmentalist among an entire company of like 150 people, all of them with high school educations, mm -hmm. many of them who, who didn't have a grasp of climate change, you know, didn't believe in it, quote unquote. Um, you know, finding, finding places of compromise was powerful. I, I was absolutely committed to them getting the lowest cost construction, which I knew I could deliver if it didn't have fossil fuel infrastructure because that would raise costs. Mm -hmm. Adding gas was more money than not adding gas. So we could agree and we could start a whole new division of the company in affordable housing competing for funds that had competitive scoring around zero net energy. I could agree to help them make money, made that guy millions of dollars yeah. helping him get affordable housing built for low income housing and, and even, if, even, if, even if the boss personally rejected the idea of government subsidies on a personal level, he was more than willing to accept millions of dollars from the government. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> and hate it. You know? Yeah, and be mad about <laughs> it. Rich <yeah>. that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, I love resist. it. I love it. You're, you're synthesizing everything. You're kind of just bringing it all yeah. together and integrating it and, and really coming at it from a, a smart perspective. I think it works in any business. Um, when you, when you do things that way and you, you know, really look at a multiple cost benefit analysis is, uh, analyses, not just the, the, um, like a sort of older way of thinking of risk equals cost necessarily. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you, you, you took some risks and showed that it was possible to, um, to succeed and to innovate. Yeah, and it included putting it into my own house. Like mm. the first heat pump projects that my client, that my boss was willing to do happened after I walked them into my living room and showed them how warm and comfortable my house was with this new heat pump I just installed. Mm. Having a demonstration house and having a demonstration lifestyle has been really key to my success and the success of tons of other people who have been involved in that demonstration house up on campus. You know, you have to live it at least a little bit before you can evangelize about it. Yeah, honestly. Yeah. Um, but just to be uh, clear, the reason I have this business now mm -hmm. is because when I worked at the city of Arcata, they did fire me for oh, protesting okay. one of the developments that the mayor wanted personally because her best friend was the donor mm -hmm. to her campaign and also the owner of the company. So having been fired by the government over at public schools, for legitimate assistance, you know, normal stuff with kids. Mm -hmm. I've been fired by the city of Arcata um, for on my private time helping out, saying like, this is wrong, you should develop this farmland with a factory. That's not cool, there's a factory spot next door, go work there. Yeah. Um, that 
having my own business has made me um, invulnerable to being fired. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and I deeply appreciate that. Um, that's great. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, re I respect that a lot, you know, and, and I think that with the opportunities that are available now, you know, just, just overall globally and certainly in America, you know, there's more people can start businesses because of the technology that, that's available and people buying things online. And, you know, we've all gone through a oh, really, yeah. a really big shift recently. Um, uh, I think like the internet in terms of when I started in business in 2005, a set of apartment complex plans would take up like 50 or 60 pounds of paper in my arms. <laughs> and now they get emailed you know, back and forth. There's, I can be anywhere. And my, none of us in my company have an official office that we go to. Oh, wow. Yeah, we're completely distributed and we've always been that way because the internet facilitates all the business that we try to do. There's nothing that, like in the old days, you had to have a big office and a huge printer and copying machines and et cetera. All of that's irrelevant right now. Just Well, that brings me to an interesting thing that I've been asking you know, some folks, and I know you've done a lot of work, obviously, in the for-profit space, um, but also with, with Redwood, um, which is also for-profit. Um, yep. Yeah, but you guys uh, work on a lot of, uh, like you said, affordable housing initiatives, um, everything. I mean, you, you do everything from mixed use to office to industrial, really. Yeah. Right? Am I right? Yeah, I, we, we'll do commercial and we'll do big buildings and mostly we do affordable housing. We help people think about how to do industrial design, but I've never actually worked on an industrial project. Okay. So like, I've accumulated resources out of curiosity and a sense of that, like the need to inform the public about high temperature heat pumps to make steam mm -hmm. or things like that. But uh, other engineering firms have gotten those kinds of gigs, usually like prisons and universities that, so I've helped out. Yeah. Um, Most affordable housing. That's what I okay, focus cool. on. Well, that's great that you get to, you know, make a difference in that way and also, you know, make money while doing it. Um, and, so I guess my, my question is, uh, have you found, you know, from, from all that work with everything that's going on right now, you guys are a company that, you know, all of your people are working remotely for the most part. You don't have a, a main office. What are your thoughts over where we're headed with sort of commercial office space and, you know, commercial retail and malls. And I mean, do you have any creative ideas of, of how those buildings and those uh, structures can be retrofitted or reused in, in some innovative ways? I don't know if that's in the conversation yeah. that you're having on a regular basis or not. For sure. So my brother, um, he develops in New York City. He usually has like three or four different 40 story, 40 story tall buildings that he's leading the wow. construction of. It's in the family. So, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, totally independent, you know, yeah. completely different paths arrived at a similar place. Um, so, you know, he's looking at realistically these apartment complexes and these commercial spaces. Um, he's looking at like, if you have office spaces in the downtown of New York and people don't need to come to offices anymore, and a lot of businesses in New York City are continuing to tell their staff to stay at home and right. other businesses like Facebook and Twitter have said, you know what, this actually works so well this could be forever. One of the biggest impacts on climate change our society has is our commuter lifestyle of living one place and then going to work someplace else. Mm -hmm. And I love my commute. It's fantastic to just roll <laughs> out of bed and be, you know, I can like hug my kids and have breakfast, all sorts of things that I think a lot of people are deprived of in the morning because they have to spend an hour in a car or on a train. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm hoping that people learn from this is that we could have been doing this for years now. You know, we started this business in 2011 as a completely internet based business and I have no paper files. That's incredible. And, and that's about how long we could have been cutting the commute out of a lot of people's lives and saving and, a lot of carbon a lot and of being smarter in the development of what was to come too. you know, and got yeah. a bit of a head start on the, crisis we find ourselves in now. I, I mean, I hope that these downtown buildings of commercial spaces get converted to apartments to answer mm -hmm. your question. Yeah. There's some challenges because there's so much interior space to these buildings and so few windows and you have to have windows to have a legal bedroom. Right. That's just a component of a legal bedroom is a window. So 
there's a lot of there. Structurally, um, uh, do you know like how hard it is to cut windows into a structure that obviously is structurally sound, but when you start messing with the window, totally doable. Yeah, it but is. that's not the problem. You can totally add windows to the outside without it being an issue, but you can't add windows to the inside. And if a, if a building takes up a city block and it just has windows on the outside, if it's an apartment complex, it's a donut. And right. all the way down the middle, you have access to windows so it can be legally occupied as housing. So there is an outdoor, there's an exterior rind to these buildings that's residentially retrofittable and there's an interior core that isn't. And Interesting. that might be just fine though, to have offices on the inside as they always have with, mm -hmm. with um, you know, just lighting, not daylight, and then have the whole exterior of a building be apartments. Very feasible retrofit. I think it'd make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> That's cool. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And it's sort of a different idea of mixed use too, where it's not a, um, an Oreo, it's not a stack, it's more integrated yeah. into the building and the systems of the building uh, in a way that, I don't know, might be a good, a good way of thinking about some new construction too. Could be, you know. Um, the, when I think about new and existing construction, just to share something with you. Mm -hmm. So I focus on making buildings fossil fuel free and solar powered, but I've come to understand and learn that the carbon impacts of building that building oh, are carbon. The embodied carbon, mostly in the cement and secondarily in the steel, mm -hmm. mostly in the cement. And there's a lot of strategies to reduce the cement or decrease the amount of GHGs caused by the same amount of cement. But that causes the same amount of climate pollution that I'm sort of offsetting in the first 30 years. Now with the solar panel, it gets offset in the first year or so. It's, mm -hmm. it's the carbon that was created in the world to manufacture that panel gets mitigated by the solar panel collecting sunshine. No more carbon sort of makes up its own energy deficit in a year, carbon deficit. Buildings take 30 years and our climate change impact is, you know, we need to be stopping it in the next decade radically. And if <laughs> 30 years is too way too far out there, like far too many problems are going to happen as a consequence of dealing with things. Right. So the, the 2030 hope, challenge, they're they're focused on 2040, I believe, as the as the net zero carbon. They're they're trying to get to yeah. net zero operational by by 2030 and then by 2040. So they're looking at it about about 20 years. But even the DOE, I think, is saying 2050 is like the absolute last. You know. Yeah. Like, it, like, we start thinking about 30 years. We're going to keep pushing it off and pushing it off, and it's not going to happen. So architecture 2030, I and mean, that's such an inspiring movement because they're so, so science-based, but mm -hmm. even those timelines have only a two and three chance of keeping us below about two degrees of temperature change, and beyond which you know, we have societal-wide serious problems with monsoons and flooding in the Midwest and droughts and like the things that we're already seeing now that are, are really terrible. Yeah. Um, you know, the Syrian war began with a drought so I, I hope that we go even faster. I, I wouldn't look at the Department of Energy um, as a guide. <laughs> right. yeah. I'm not even sure Architecture 2030 is fast enough. We're all just trying to figure out what's the fastest we can humanly get this done. Mm -hmm. so, we, so the fewest number of species go extinct and the fewest number of people die. And there's the least amount of health impacts for those who live. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's one of the things we've been trying to stress too in the podcast is that this isn't about you know, as long as you make it about the future and future generations, then you're mm -hmm. losing about half the people because like they're so focused on the here and the now and the, you know, anxiety of, am I going to have enough money? And, you know, just the daily, the daily concerns of, of being human that they're not really able to extrapolate out very far. And um, I get that. I, I, get, I get in that, yeah. in that zone sometimes too. And I have to pull <sighs> myself out of it. Um, and when you start, when you focus on health, and you start focusing on like the survival of us right now. Uh, you know, I think we have a real opportunity with everything that's happened in the last few months um, to make some of those changes. So I'm hoping that this is sort of a kick in the pants in that direction uh, rather than just sort of a blip. Can I share a story with you? Please. 
so in 2017, it was when the first wildfires in California were catastrophic, mm -hmm. right? And we got to see Santa Rosa um, burn, like the northern part of it. Uh, so that had a very personal effect on me. Uh, it wasn't just that my friends were fleeing into town from various wildfires out here in Humboldt County, because there were a lot of wildfires and people were running into town to save their own lives and they lost their homes. Mm -hmm. But um, my mother-in-law, uh, she had vulnerable lungs because she'd had cancer as a child and the radiation therapy in the 60s really scars the tissue around where the treatment was. Mm -hmm. So she'd always had a bit of a cough. And after living a week in Santa Rosa during the fires, she died um, at the dinner table. She coughed to death. And she Sorry to hear that. Right. And her lungs filled up with fluid. And then they rescued her at the hospital. They brought her back to life. And then she died again. And they brought her back to life again. And then she tapped out on the third time. And she died about two months later when she'd lost most of 100 pounds of just tubes. Just the whole everything. It was all tubes. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. And, and it, was, it, was, it was horrifying. It was horrifying on so many levels. Um, but I, on a personal level, find that like, it was such a grizz, grisly death to have been invaded with all these tubes and not be able to talk anymore. And, you know, it's just, and after that, I felt like, you know, if the government isn't here to save us from death from fires, like from imminent death of people being burned alive in their cars that they're fleeing or burning alive in their homes or holding on to their, their loved ones as they pass. I mean, cause there were serious fires all over the world. There was like almost 40 people in Greece that died on the coast and they couldn't get down to the beach and they're just, their corpses are all just people hugging each other. Um, like that, that was all happening at the same time as Nan was dying over and over. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 that was when I ran out of complete patience. It was also the same fall that my house had a gas leak in the front yard and they came out and told us that it was explosive and that, that, that if someone had thrown a cigarette butt at our, our yard, our home might have blown up. Wow. And it's just like, I have curse words in my head that I'm not going to be saying yeah. right now, but it was yeah. just way too much to have first an explosive gas leak in my yard and then have my mother-in-law die in this horrible way because of the fires. And, and, and so that was, for me, that was the, that was the last year that I was, had any patience. And I understand other people not, might not feel that way because they haven't had such a, a personally grim, scary, sh terrible thing happen. Um, but I, I share the story because it can happen, of course, to anyone. And when I have shared the story, when I've like gone to conferences and you know, I frequently cry, and I've, my family's encouraged me to tell the story, by the way, because yeah. it's cool. Yeah, um, please. It's, then people will come up to me like, yeah, actually, and my aunt died in the mudslides down over here. Mm. You know, that's a terrible thought because there are also fires and then mudslides from the land that was denuded of trees and then rains came. And yeah. uh, I hope that, um, that similarly to having people get out on the streets and protest that we see the protest of the forests and our atmosphere as expressed through in crazy weather experiences that, that kill people, um, including fires. I, I think that's the commonality yeah. of this moment is like uh, every year now we've had California burn for half a year and kill a whole bunch of people and destroy billions of dollars worth of property and, and upend our politics even in our whole And now as we speak, COVID. there's Arizona and Texas. And I mean, it, it's expanding, you know, to other areas yeah. um, too. not, not to, you know, make light of anything that's happening in California, certainly, but yeah, it's just, oh. you can see, you can literally see the, the expansion of these things and where, you know, there were only two or three States that ever had to deal with hurricanes. And now you've got, you know, catastrophic flooding that's happening all up the you know coast because of it. And, um, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's coming it's for all of us. Yeah. It's like real. We're all, and, <laughs> we're all underneath this atmosphere. None of us are not yeah. right in the middle of it. What do you say? Uh, have you had conversations with, you know, in your work or in your personal life with people who, um, you know, still at this point don't see climate change as, as a real thing. And, and what, what do you say to that other than telling your own story and trying to, you know, get them to empathize, I guess. Um, 
I, uh, I do not have many conversations anymore with people who don't believe in climate change. You know, I've lived in a bubble where, you know, as a science teacher, so I got to speak on my own terms. Mm -hmm. And when I worked at um, this development company, I avoided the environmental talk and, and just focus really hard on what we could agree on was the financials. The cost, yeah. And, you know, and I, and I live myself out loud, as you said, you know, as uh, on a personal level as an activist for just being a human being the way that is non-normative. <laughs> um, and I, I, you know, California's politics are dramatically in favor of people understanding the reality of climate change. And it's just so in your face. You know, these wildfires get you everywhere in the state because they smoke you out in San Francisco, even if they're three hours to the, the east. Yeah, you know, yeah it's that's the whole area. Blows. Yeah. Um, so I don't see any opposition in this state. This state is just profoundly moving forward, except for the gas companies hmm. who will play, pay lip service but will do everything in their power to fund, you know, astroturf organizations to try to object to electrification ordinances, um, to put up, you know, spurious timelines. Like we're going to solve this in 2070. That's what Shell Oil has been putting out in the papers everywhere. You know, be with us. Just, Shell just wait till 2070. We've got a solution in 2070. Oh man! Don't worry about it. We'll all be dead. But you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously. Like I said, you know, I think I think bringing it back to the here and the now is obviously uh, a good a good strategy, you know, that be, because yeah. pe people that aren't just willing to accept something or or think that far out or, or whatever that you can speak to their when we're past the due, the yeah, like, like you know, that we should have been taking this seriously. I learned about climate change in eighth grade in my science book text. It was right there, laid out. I can remember all the images. You know, it was on the front page of Scientific American, on the front page of, like, on the cover of Time magazine, like, 1990, 1989, mm -hmm. everyone knew. Mm -hmm. and, and so ever since then, we've just been delaying the inevitable while the gas companies continue to become the most wealthy and corrupt organizations on the planet. <laughs> it's like, nothing good's happened since we've been delaying. Yeah, you, there was an interesting stat, I think, that you... Um that you said in your all all electric uh, multifamily talk that I that I was at at one point, hmm. where you said basically the cost that we're paying to the gas companies um, to build a home or to build a building and and you know put the quote unquote uh, gas lines into the building, it, like the, those actual lines are not what we're paying for. What we're really paying for is the infrastructure on sort of the back end, the, you know, development end um, for them to continue growing their, their business and their empire and, you know, their yeah. extension. And that's, yeah. I mean, let me, that's, yeah, let me list that pretty dark. For people. So <laughs> yeah. the fail here is there's this, there's a, um, you can look up what's called the utility death spiral. So utilities talk about this all the time. The general public doesn't realize that when people are billed for the utility bills, about 80% of your gas bill is a charge for infrastructure development, not for the gas. So four out of five dollars you're paying them is to pay for pipes. And if they don't continue to lay pipes every year, they don't get paid that four out of five dollars. It's very hard to imagine a business model in which you take 80% of the money out, but that's essentially what we're proposing to do in these city ordinances, 31 of them in California, and including two counties that have either banned or significantly restricted the expansion of gas expansion. infrastructure. Yeah. And that's their business. Their business is to build gas infrastructure every year. As soon as they stop building new gas infrastructure, they lose 80% of their revenue. And that leads into a dramatic death spiral where they don't have enough money, so they have to charge more for the gas, a lot mm -hmm. more, like four or five times more. Wow. No one wants that gas at that price. Right. So then they collapse where people don't want it and it accelerates people removing themselves from the gas infrastructure. And at so, the same time, the price of electricity and solar and all of these other technologies down. And innovations is going, well, it is going down as, yeah. you, as you said already, I mean, drastically um, and can only continue to do so. So that's a pretty good argument against those sort of naysayers who are like, well, you know, electricity is way more expensive than, uh, you know, than gas, like blah, blah, blah. Well, you just explained why. Gas is a shell game. Gas is where they, they get 40-year bonds, and now you're paying them every year for the next 40 years for infrastructure that's going to be turned off in the next 10 to 15 years. Hmm. And so they have humongous risk of stranded assets 
are basically money that will not get paid back to the bondholders. It, it, so right now, natural gas is at a tipping point in the country. At conferences, they're talking about this. Mm -hmm. In utility newsletters, are talking about this, about how natural gas digging has not been profitable since 2009. They continue to have investments that people are trying to make in the natural gas fracking because they think a technological innovation is going to just finally make it profitable. But they continue to play a shell game of bringing in new investment money. So our fracking boom is not actually profitable. And the infrastructure like, and the utility bill side of it quickly falls apart when you stop buying new natural gas or we start limiting the, the new pipelines around the country. A lot of pipelines have been turned down. That's mm -hmm. a huge amount of money for a company to get paid $60 billion to put in a pipeline. That's a mm -hmm. nice sale. Yeah. And if no one's buying it, these businesses, their stock value tanks. So I, I'm optimistic mm -hmm. <laughs> about cool. a rapid shutdown in the fossil fuel industry. Yeah. I think it's totally possible. And the real worry is how to transition employees who are, are not at fault and didn't make millions or billions of dollars off this game. You know, they're, they're following, just trying to get a job. Tons and tons of us all just need a job at times, right? Don't yeah. get to follow our passions and such. So the, the discussion in California where they've spent millions of dollars now on planning a just transition, that's money well spent. Yeah. That's the right thing for us all to do. So we don't have instability in our society with lots of upset, dispossessed employees of gas companies. We want them to be able to transition to the electric utility. <laughs> just keep your job, just slightly different tasks, but you know, that's life. You gotta yeah. learn how to do new things, but you can stay in the energy industry. You're welcome. Well, um, and it's it's a really good yeah, you're 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 keeping the the momentum going, um, you know, job creation and like if you can help make that transition and take some of that cost away from the companies that are, um, you know, they're having to, to pay for it. Like if you can sub, you know, uh, sorry, my son is crying in the background. I, I, <laughs> I had my kids a, are yelling, excited oh, background over here. Right, we'll, have a, we'll have a kid moment. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Um, yeah. I became a dad about three months ago, actually Friday. It'll be Congratulations. three months. Yeah. Thanks so much. That's huge. Um, that's been super cool having a son, and and it it is just like uh, I'm gonna forget my last question because it was going. Well, on. let's just talk about your commitment <laughs> to the future. Yeah, like there's, there's a lot of apocalyptic thinking. It's all the books are apocalyptic, the movies are apocalyptic. It's very genre popular. It's very popular genre right now. Oh yeah, at the apocalypse. Um, I. I'm trying to work towards a utopish lifestyle. Not utopian. I'm not so vain as to think that I can pull that off. Just my own personal version of happiness, like utopish kind yeah, of. Yeah, I like that. Self-aware and cynical about, you know, could I, you know, but it's, I live in, I live in a very nice garden. My office here is in the middle of, there's piglets right next to this. So you are having a child. You're promising the future that you're going to keep on trying hard. Mm -hmm. for the sake and of it's those person. and it's those little things you know it's uh, and you have to shift it because you know for a long time you felt really good just recycling right and then they mm -hmm. tell you that basically china's not taking any of our recycling anymore <laughs> so now you know now i feel somewhat guilty when i recycle like you know they're, they're these little things that we can make changes about but the information is out there and that's what's that's the thing that i'm really hopeful about um and what we're trying to do to some degree uh with this podcast is like just keep the conversation going, keep the, the interest in um, and the commitment to uh, innovating out of this because we can, you know, I, like I, I'm very confident that we have people and systems in place in this country and across the, the world, you know, but especially in the U S to innovate our way out of this, but not in 2070. That's the, <laughs> no. that's the big, I, the big key. Yeah. You know, here's the good news is that it's non-political, you know, all electric construction is more popular in the American South than anywhere else in the country because mm -hmm. it's very uh, just consumer oriented and they're trying to build the least cost house. Mm -hmm. The tons of them, you know, can you tell us how much the average uh, single family uh, house saves by not installing gas lines and going? Oh, yeah, and it's huge. Um, in California, it's no less than $20,000 a house in additional cost, which when you take a mortgage means it's about $40,000 when you pay it off. And that's because of the gas piping in the street that you have to pay for. Every development, the gas in the street is paid for by the developer and therefore charged to your lot. 
-hmm. and then it's the lateral pipe, which you also pay for personally. Uh, not the meter, that's the utility, they pay for it, but you pay for it in your bills, it all gets paid for, <laughs> nothing yeah. is free. And then you pay for gas, infrastructure piping in your walls, and at the end of the day, you've got about 20 grand in California, maybe 10 grand in other states. Okay. I just got delivered a peach. That is awesome. <laughs> from our local <laughs> farmer friends, fellow activists. He, uh, he studied riparian uh, conservation and bringing back um, the salmon locally. And then oh, he wow. started a dry farm next to the river. So he pulls no water out of the river and he grows peaches and these like super wet, juicy peaches. I That's think that incredible. And they're so tasty because he doesn't irrigate them. Huh. It's and because he's I, allowing the soil to do what it's supposed yeah, to do. When he does, he does good work. He builds up organic matter and he does a dry till where it's a dust mulch essentially. So he doesn't put extra mulch on, but he breaks up the, the capillaries in the soil. Huh. I guess but what I'm hopeful is that because all electric construction, non fossil fuel construction, is cheaper to build, that we don't have to argue about whether or not climate change is real. We can just agree that it's cheaper to build without fossil fuels. Yeah. And Who's a fool that wastes money? Right. Who in business is here to just waste it? And, and we can have a very like brass tacks conversation on stop wasting money, mm -hmm. stop forcing other people to waste their money. Why is it that California is like 99% of all the installations in the last decade use natural gas? In the rest of the United States, one in four homes is all electric. California is completely on the other side of the map in so many ways, but ironically, it's super in favor of fossil fuel installations. Really bizarre for such a progressive, uh, you know, you know state. Enron freaked people out with the whole scam in 2000, the electricity crisis, that mm -hmm. was all about gaming the delivery of natural gas to the state. But we didn't know that until about 2005 and six and seven. And our code in 2002, three and four was created to prevent people from electrifying loads because the thinking was that we'd just gone through an electricity crisis, not realizing we'd actually gone through a humongous scam on natural gas pricing. So our state has been pushing people to hook up the natural gas ever since with the way their code works. Um, we learned the wrong lessons from yeah. the, the Enron scandal. Huh. And it, it's only been uh, the 2019 energy code, just essentially last year, this year. Um, that the state's corrected it and has made it so that you can put in an all electric home. They've literally forbidden it. it so that, that's how bad it got is that every home had to have natural gas unless you did a double backflip and you know, broke a couple minor laws. Um, that's incredible. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's really intense. Oh it's really hard to start a consultancy in all electric construction. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Um, one percent of construction in California was all electric for the last decade, and most of that one percent was our stuff. And it was, it was like being. Uh, it required activism. It required a certain amount of of rule breaking attitude to say like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> I don't care what your code says. You can't not. You, no. Well, yeah, and now they're. I mean, you said you said it right. You said correcting it. Um, yeah. But yeah, now they're legislating against it. I didn't know that whole backstory. So that's really fascinating because I've been like, rah, rah, California. And now, now it's like, well, I guess, yeah, they're doing it now. But No one's perfect. Yeah, People exactly. make mistakes. People do make mistakes. And, and yeah. grace is a good thing. So yeah, and, and we did get scammed. I mean, you know, that was a yeah. real thing. They, they scammed us. Duke, Reliant, Enron. It was, a, it was a real scam. People went to jail. One guy died. One guy committed suicide. Hmm. Um, and... Yeah, well-intentioned people at the state, at the Energy Commission, um, continued with the wrong lessons for too long. And, yeah. um, but we can all come back around together on the fact that it's cheaper to build without fossil fuels and it's way more energy efficient now that we have heat pumps. Mm -hmm. And um, it's obviously way less polluting and our state is filthy. You know, almost everyone in California lives in a dirty air basin. So, you know, like we need to work harder at this um, just for <laughs> sake of our own kids. You know, you're, you're raising your child probably yeah, in a exactly. dirty air basin, right? Uh, yeah, I guess I am. I mean, I am in Santa Monica, so I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that we do have some prevailing winds that are um, mm -hmm. blowing our way for the, for the most part. So we keep our windows open and we enjoy mm -hmm. those breezes and, you know, put a sweater on uh, if we need to in the middle of June, which is weird. Um, <laughs> but uh, pay for that clean air. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, I think we're breathing pretty healthy air for the most part. Um, 
Uh, I wanted to end uh, on, on something, you know, interesting. I always love to ask this question. We've hit on most other things I was thinking about asking. Um, but tell me the most exciting building technology that you've uh, heard about or you've read about to date or recently, um, whatever, whatever the case may be. Uh, I'll, I'll just sure. give you a little, little challenge, I guess. Um, the last person that I asked who was an architect said silkworms. So there you go. <laughs> Oh, he's gone old school, like still. <laughs> um, uh, I know another architect is trying to, to grow buildings out of yeah. coral. Um, oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. I've heard the mushroom thing before, too. Yep, that mushroom installation's real. Um, the thing I'm most excited about is uh, Japan is the center of heat pump development. The heat pump gathers energy from a source, like the air, or a pond, like the water, or the dirt, like mm -hmm. a ground source heat pump. One of those three things, it, it pulls heat out of those out of air. Air source heat pumps are the cheapest. In Japan, if you have an air source heat pump, um, their efficiencies are up to 720%. So you use one unit of electricity. If that energy was used in a toaster, that'd be a certain amount of heat. Mm -hmm. but you, you can call that electricity heat energy, sort of. You use that electricity to operate the heat pump and it gathers seven units more of heat from the atmosphere and brings it in. Wow. That's radical efficiency. Um, in the United States, our best systems get to four or five units that we bring in. That's the best. And most of them are around three. What are they doing so, over there? What just, uh, you know, is, is the focus the story. Yeah. In okay. 1980, you know, we had a fossil fuel vice president and our president was in favor of nuclear power. That was, you know, that was Reagan was a nuclear advocate. Bush was an oil advocate and they canceled all the demonstration buildings. Mm -hmm. Right. And they decided to go heavy on domestic oil development. In Japan, they had no oil to domestically develop. They had coal and they had nuclear power and a very flat grid. And they started investing in all electric technology, like heat pumps, whereas the United States in 81, to the degree that we invest in energy efficiency, we did it in furnaces, gas furnaces. Hmm. It was like a two paths taken in the, in the woods kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese path of investing it in more and more efficient electric technologies um, is the way to get the most efficiency because there's just so much heat in the air or in the ground or in a body of water. There's just so much there. You can just keep on collecting it more efficiently. Whereas with fossil fuels, it's only as much heat as actually in that tank of gas. You blow it up, you burn it. That's the amount. It's fixed. Yeah. You can get it efficiently, but that's the amount. And, and there's essentially an endless amount in the air or in the water. Yeah. So there's just that's cool. more opportunity in electric technologies. That's very exciting. Um, I love that. And I, I assume that it can keep going from there. Yeah. Oh, the theoretical limit of efficiency is like 1,300% and we're at about 700% in Japan. So, so double yeah, almost. Yeah. Keep on going. That's pretty cool. Um, is, is there... I've got like two minutes left here. So I'm going to ask you one more. Um, is there a way for, for us to catch up, I guess? Like, yeah. I, I mean, it, it, I guess my real question, I like this idea of like a, li a liquid network, like cities exist in sort of this liquid state where ideas, you know, are thrown around mm -hmm. more. And so innovation happens at a faster rate. Uh, exponentially yeah. faster rate because yeah. there's more ideas and more people. So, you know, obviously China is not looking to share all of their uh, proprietary technology with us. So how do we catch up? Do you think that we will reach a place where like nationalism kind of, uh, I guess, well, subsides to the point where we are sharing that kind of information for the good of humanity and, and the globe? Yeah, I think the good news is that Japan, the center of heat pump design, all their manufacturers sell in the United States now. Um, so Mitsubishi and Daikin and Fujitsu and Sanyo and Atomic and a whole bunch more. Mm -hmm. um, they don't bring over their advanced heat pump technologies because they're convinced that Americans don't want them. Interesting. They've flown up and had ice cream cones with me here. Like, let's go have an organic ice cream cone at the scoop. And Daikin Altherma, the, the Daikin reps are there, or the Mitsubishi reps. And, and I'll say, we really need you to bring over your most efficient products. And they say, licking the ice cream cone, you don't want them. I'm like, what do you mean? I just told you I want them. And they're like, no, you don't. And we have this like weird, yes, I do. No, you don't. 
Um, then they're trying to speak about how the Americans don't want energy efficiency. We don't ask for it. We don't require it by code. We don't incentivize it. And they think that if they brought over their good stuff, we would not buy it. And they might not be wrong. You know, most <laughs> United States, our federal minimum is about a 220% efficient heat pump. Mm-hmm. It's garbage compared to what they have there. Um, yeah, that's incredible. So uh, California is somewhat different, but machines, uh, heat pumps, they're regulated at the federal level and the state of California cannot regulate them. They can't require them to be more efficient than what the federal government requires. So it's really difficult for California to require higher efficiency heat pumps and get them over here. The, it is relatively easy for utilities and cities to incentivize them. Mm -hmm. That's a, a possibility. And yeah, we could really use a new federal. How many, how many projects do we need? How many do we need? Do I need to order in order for them to ship them over? That's the question. Good right? question. Um, realistically, it's about, um, they would like to make a million dollars a year in profit. Okay. So, so we're talking multiple millions of units then. Uh, well, I mean, if they, if they make a thousand or two a year, a thousand or two dollars, probably a thousand dollars. That's a decent guess. $1,500 perhaps on selling a heat pump in the United States. They make it. So um, so far less. My math was way off. I I think I did the the factory the other way around. Oh, it's okay. And I'm I'm thinking like they, in in essence, they want it to be a decent product that sells. They don't want to create a niche product. They don't make money off of niche products. They they bring a niche efficiency product over. It doesn't sell. And then they'll just cancel it within a year or two. I've seen that happen a few times. They, they want it to be mainstream. So the more, the more developers, I mean, really that's what it comes down to. It comes down to developers. It comes down to big buildings. You're going to be ordering, you know, multiple units because they're not going to make, they're not going to make their money on, a, on it a single family home. The cities, the cities, because the code requirement in a city that it be all electric, mm-hmm. that changes everything. Okay. So once you stop even having gas products on the table. So Berkeley and start, Oakland and some of the, some of the other, you yeah. said there are 31 municipalities 31. now that I hear? Okay. Yeah, Santa Monica included. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, 31 different communities have moved on an ordinance to either require all electric construction or it's heavily incentivize it. And that's changing things. That's cool. That's yeah. really cool. And, and it leaves us on a, on a nice, bright, hopeful yeah. note. Yeah, we can do it in our own little towns. Every little town matters. Like all 31 of those have made a difference. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, Sean. I really, really appreciate you being here with me. Um, do you want to throw any websites, uh, phone numbers, emails out there if anybody wants to contact you? Uh, sure. Um, redwoodenergy.net is our website. Um, I'm, I'm reachable at sean at redwoodenergy.net, S-E-A-N, Sean. And um, yeah, please reach out. I'm happy to help you out. I mostly work on apartment complexes, to be, be clear. So yeah. people's individual requests, I often... We'll just give them a brief answer and direct them to one of the booklets that we've written. We have one that's specifically in single family homes, for instance, that you can just read everything and then and it saves me time. <laughs> I'll go ahead and put those links. If you send me those links, I'll put those up in the show notes. So if anybody's listening, they can just go straight to the straight Perfect. to those uh, reference pieces. Excellent. Well, All thank right. you so much. It's nice to meet you, Ian. Take yeah. care. Take care. Have a good one. Building the future. Green building in the new millennium brought to you by Sustainable Homes of the Future.